All Australians Thank you, Senator on behalf Sheldon. The time for two-minute statements has expired. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, um, President. Uh, for the information of senators, I table a revised ministry list, as tabled yesterday by the Prime Minister in the House of Representatives. It reflects a small alteration to ministerial representation in the House and some typographical changes, and I seek leave to have the revised list incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Wong. I will now move to question time. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Alice Springs, Tennant Creek and other remote towns across the Northern Territory have endured the failures of this government's policy agenda with child sexual abuse, assaults and property damage a daily occurrence in many remote communities. In response to growing community concern and considerable pressure from the general public, the Prime Minister finally recently visited Alice Springs with less than four hours on the ground. Can the minister advise why the Prime Minister thought it was acceptable to be a FIFO PM in Alice? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Mr. Madam, uh, thank you, President. Uh, and I'm uh, disappointed that Senator McKenzie, on an issue such as what we are seeing in Alice Springs, would be will choose to make such a light-hearted quip in that way. Um, we, we, we all know. We all know. Uh, senators, please continue, Senator Wong. Uh, the Prime Minister, just on the visit first, before I go to the more substantive issue, which is uh, the uh, dis intergenerational disadvantage, the, the violence, uh, the, um, uh, the, what we are seeing on the ground uh, in Alice Springs. I, I, I am advised that the Prime Minister had planned to visit Alice Springs in December, but oh, the, he, he, he contracted COVID. He contracted COVID. Uh, and so that was delayed. Now, obviously, the next opportunity he was able to visit was the 24th of January. Uh, Minister Burney has visited Alice Springs on a number of occasions, and of course, we are quite blessed in the Labor Party to have Senator McCarthy, uh, the uh, member for Lingiari, and many others who uh, engage very closely uh, on these issues. Now, it is the case. Uh, it is the case that. Uh, yesterday, um, the Prime Minister, uh, as you know, announced uh, uh, additional support uh, for uh, the Northern Territory. Uh, and uh, it is the case uh, that it is the case that the Stronger Futures program, which ended under you, which ended under you, with no plan, with no plan. So, it, so, so, so it is interesting in this place that you wish to come in here and play partisan politics on an issue where you dropped the ball, where, where you dropped the ball at the end uh, of the Stronger Futures Thank you, Senator Wong. Your time has expired. Order. I'm going to call uh, Senator McKenzie for her order. Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Thank you. Before the election, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, "If I'm the Prime Minister." I won't go missing when the going gets tough, or pose for photos and then disappear when the job's done. Can the minister advise the Senate why the Prime Minister spent three nights at the Australian Open posing for photos and not a single night in Alice Springs? Uh, thank you, Senator McKenzie. Uh, Senator Wong. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested. Uh, that uh, Senator McKenzie chooses to remind everyone of what Mr. Morrison was like. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I would what I would say what I would say is this: uh, first, on the tennis, I mean, uh, you know, I, I hope that this is. Uh, I hope that you are very careful about who on your side has gone to major sporting events, uh, because because I can say to you, I can say to you, I, I, I remember a lot of. Party ministers with a lot of good hats at the Order. Melman Cup Senator and Wong. other things. So Senator let's... Wong, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Point of order on relevance, Madam uh, President. Just a moment, Senator McKenzie. Order on my right, Senator McKenzie. Point of order on relevance, Madam President. The minister was asked about time in Alice Springs, talking to local communities and addressing the crisis that's unfolding there. Uh, Not... Thank you. And I would ask for silence. Order. 
I would ask for silence. I had difficulty hearing Senator Wong because of all of the interjections, Senator Wong. Well, um, I, I, I were, were, were that you did ask me that question, because that, I would have treated that question with some respect. But no, you want to make a partisan point. Yep. You want to make a partisan point about the tennis. And you want to make a partisan point about the tennis. Let me say this. Stronger Futures ended in July 2022. There was no plan, uh, part of the previous government, to manage the transition. We have listened to community. We have listened to community and we have provided additional uh, thank resources. You, Senator Wong, to your time has expired. Thank you, Senator Wong. Your time has expired. Senator McKenzie, second supplementary. Community leaders have warned the serious crime wave affecting the Northern Territory communities has the potential to spread to other remote communities across Western Australia, Queensland and South Australia, with the government's abolition of the cashless debit card. When will the Prime Minister visit those other communities where the CDC has been abolished? Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Senator Wong. Well, well I'm asked now about the CDC. Um, uh, no. I would make a, make a few points. Um, uh, first, in relation to uh, what we are seeing in the Northern Territory, uh, it is distressing. It is. Uh, deeply worrying and it is devastating for communities and that's why we're acting that is why we're acting and that is why recognizing recognizing Order on my that left. senator cash and senator rustin she's a very good minister uh, that is why uh, the prime minister after consultation with the northern territory government uh, and after consultation uh, with the um, uh, Ms. Anderson, Daryl and Anderson, uh, has, provide, has made a decision with the, su the support of the cabinet to provide $250 million worth of additional funding for support. Uh, it is a reminder of uh, how much uh, all governments uh, need to do to address the intergenerational disadvantage you, which we Wong. are the seeing. The time for this question has expired. Senator Pratt. President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. In recent days, the world has been confronted with devastating scenes following earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Can the minister update the Senate on the situation on the ground, please? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Pratt for her question. And certainly, particularly overnight, what we have seen uh, in Turkey and Syria uh, has been devastating. Uh, and I know this is an issue that many colleagues in the chambers, uh, chamber are uh, concerned about and, and share Senator Pratt's interest uh, and concern about these issues. So I want to acknowledge that so many from the parliament uh, include, and across the community have reached out to my office uh, to express concern and to ask what they can do and what our country can do. Uh, the true extent of this devastation is still emerging. Uh, what we do know is that, that, is that at 4.13 a.m. local time on Monday, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake struck at Nurdar, Turkey, in the far east of the country near the border with Syria. Uh, then, at 1.24 p.m. that afternoon, a second of magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake struck Elbistan, which is 80 kilometres to the south. The affected provinces have been devastated by a series of 100 aftershocks. The devastation of, this earth, of the earthquake spanned both Turkey and Syria, and we know that these are extraordinarily vulnerable parts of the world, parts of the world which are already <coughs> devastated by conflict and by disruption. I'm not in a position to advise the Senate of verified numbers. What I can say is that media reports just before I came into question time uh, put the number of those who have perished in these earthquakes of at least 3,800. This will almost certainly rise. Rescuers are still searching through collapsed buildings. Access to the affected areas is being hampered by damage to roads and collapsed buildings, severe weather and traffic from those trying to flee. The impact in Syria is still emerging and the affected areas are in non-government held territories, which means information very difficult to verify. The government is monitoring the situation closely and I'll, in subsequent answers I'll respond to uh, what the government is seeking uh, to you, do. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Pratt, first supplementary. What do we know, please, about Australians in affected areas? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. I, I know some MPs and senators have had Australians uh, contact them about family in affected areas. 
Uh, our diplomatic missions in Ankara, Beirut and Istanbul are working closely with local authorities to ascertain the welfare of our citizens. Ankara Post is following up on a small number of Australian citizens who may be in the affected areas, and I'm not in a position at this stage to provide any further details. Uh, Australians in need of emergency consular assistance uh, should contact our 24-hour consular emergency centre. Uh, that is uh, 612 6261 3305. Uh, and on 1300 555 the latter number, if calling from within Australia. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator, uh, sorry, Senator Wong. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Thank you. What is the Australian government doing to support all those affected? Senator Wong. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Albanese announced uh, in the press conference held just over an hour and a half ago an initial commitment of $10 million in humanitarian aid to support the people of Turkey and Syria. $7 million will be dispersed immediately. $4 million of that will be delivered to support those affected in Turkey through the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Appeal. These funds will support the delivery of food, shelter and basic aid items. We have also allocated $3 million to North West Syria to be delivered through UNICEF to assist with immediate needs with a particular focus on women and girls. Uh, an additional $3 million will be allocated as we work to understand needs on the ground. Uh, this is obviously uh, a crisis. Uh, it is a crisis uh, which is affecting so many of our fellow human beings. Uh, we will continue to monitor the unfolding situation on the ground. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Please leave, grant, leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. President, I thank the Senate. Uh, Senator, can I associate uh, the opposition and coalition parties with the remarks made by Senator Wong and the government in sending our most sincere condolences to the people of Turkey and Syria following yesterday's major earthquake and the events that have unfolded since? When we go to bed at night and tuck our children into bed, none of us imagine that the homes we are living in will collapse upon us in the midst of the night. As Turkey's ambassador to Australia said to me when I spoke with him earlier today, he recounted stories that he is seeing of those in the zone saying they now feel ashamed to go to sleep. The difficulties that are facing the human toll, not just the immediate loss of life, the many thousands to whom we send uh, our love, prayers and best wishes, uh, who have lost loved ones, the thousands more injured, but of course the ongoing humanitarian crisis that follows from a tragedy and disaster like this. It is of course in these events we see the best of humanity, rescuers working heroically, international community responding comprehensively, disaster and aid workers coming to provide assistance, and even Ukraine fighting for its freedom, offering to provide support. We acknowledge and thank the government for the support that they have announced and provided. Uh, we stand with the government in supporting that and in supporting the Australian Turkish and Australian Syrian communities in this time of concern for all of them. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, President. And my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. As reported by the West Australian newspaper today, in the WA Goldfields town of Laverton, formerly a place where the cashless debit card was in operation, last week the Desert Inn Hotel, after discussions with the local police, voluntarily imposed liquor restrictions to combat alcohol fuelled violence. What role has the withdrawal of the cashless debit card played in increasing crime, domestic violence and dysfunction in Laverton? Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President, and I thank uh, Senator uh, Cash uh, for, uh, for her question. Um, um, <clears throat> the cashless uh, debit card was obviously a controversial uh, issue um, going into the uh, to the last election, and as a as a government, um, well, sorry, as an opposition, uh, we took to the Australian people the proposition that uh, <coughs> we should uh, remove the cashless uh, debit card, and of course, one of the first things that the new Minister for Social uh, Services, uh, Minister uh, <coughs> Rishworth, did uh, was to introduce legislation uh, into this place. Uh, Senator um, Farrell, please resume your seat. 
Senator Cash. You are, President, and uh, I think it's pretty obvious the point of order is relevant. Could you at least direct your comments to the alcohol fueled violence in Laverton? Uh, thank, thank you, President. You, Senator Cash. Um, the minister is being relevant. You have asked about the CDC. He's entitled to um, put the government's uh, reasons for its abolition. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, uh, um, Madam President. Um, so, so we, we took the proposition to the Australian people, and that included um, <coughs> Senator Cash, people in Western Australia, and, and well, 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 the people in Western Australia uh, voted overwhelmingly for an, Anth an Anthony Albanese Labor government. In fact, in fact, you know. Senator Cash, you know as well as I do the number of seats that your government lost in, in Western Australia. Your, your, so all, all I'm saying is, all Order. I'm saying, all, Order. Senator Rustin. Um, Minister, please continue. Look, look, we, we took our policy to the last, we took our policy to the last election and you you would be you would be you would be you would be appalled you would be appalled if we didn't do what we said we were going to do uh, thank you minister your time has expired senator cash thank you president the shire of laverton president patrick hill was today reported as saying the kids are not getting fed the women get bashed up and it's going back to the way it was minister what are you going to do to protect the women and children in Laverton and other towns around Australia where you've withdrawn the cashless debit card? Uh, thank you, Senator Cash, Minister. Um, regrettably, Senator Cash, the issues that you raise uh, as uh, significant issues in Laverton are not unique uh, to that town. Um, and the whole, the whole the whole, the whole issues. Let's Order. let's take let's take one of the issues that you're you're talking about. Let's take one of the issues that you're talking about, um, Senator Cash. When I'm deliberately answering or doing my best to answer your questions, um, well, that may be so. That may be so. But the people of Australia have made a decision and one of the reasons one of the reasons one of the reasons they voted for us at the last election were our policies on domestic violence one of our one of the reasons they voted for us was our policies on domestic violence now i i don't say that we i don't say that overnight that we are going to solve all Thank of the problems. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Uh, just a moment, Senator Cash. I'll wait until there's silence on your side. Senator Rustin, I've just called for silence. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Minister, will you commit to restoring the cashless debit card as a matter of urgency in Laverton and in other communities being ravaged by alcohol fueled crime, violence and dysfunction? because your government abolished it last year, and will you apologise to the people of Laverton? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Farrell. Um, look, I, I can only reiterate, reiterate the comments that uh, Senator Wong made a few moments ago, that politicising these sorts of issues in this way, in this, in this Senate, politicising these issues in this way gives does, does you no credit? Does you no credit, Senator, <coughs> Senator Cash? It does Order. you no credit. It does you no credit to take advantage of the of the the, uh, the issues that are going on in this town and other towns and other towns um, to try and make some get some sort of political advantage uh, out Senator of Farrell, the. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. I'm going to ask for silence to allow the minister to finish the question. Please continue, Minister Farrell. Thank you, um, um, I reiterate my point. Um, it, it's, it, uh, it doesn't do you any good, Senator Cash, to be seeking to be seeking to use 
the disadvantage Thank you, Minister. of the time for this question has expired. Senator Waters. Very much, President. My question is to uh, Senator Wong, representing the Prime Minister. Last week's annual donations data release revealed around two million dollars in donations from fossil fuel companies and lobbyists to both big parties, including 960,000 of that to the Labor Party. And in that financial year, four big donors are some of the highest polluting facilities covered by the proposed safeguard mechanism. Woodside, Blue Scope, Chevron and Inpex. Collectively, they've donated over 200,000 to the Labor Party in 2021-22. How much access to the table did that buy when Labor was designing your weak safeguard mechanism legislation? And are those dirty donations why your safeguard mechanism backs new coal and gas? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Wong. Uh, I, I, I really reject the implication or the imputation or of some form of corruption which is in that question. And I'm reminded when I was a minister many years ago, uh, with much less grey hair, uh, and Senator Payne, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, what was the name? Christine, Senator Milne, Senator Milne, sorry, uh, was, um, <laughs> Senator Payne, Senator Payne did vote with Senator Milne. In fact, they voted together to, 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 to get, get the uh, cashless debit card. Uh, sorry, cashless debit card. I'm very tired. The CPRS um, um, uh, voted against that. And she would ask question after question to me about fossil fuel companies. And I remember saying to her at one point, you know, it may be, it is possible that we take a different position, not because we are corrupt, as is the implication, but because we just don't agree. We don't agree with a policy proposition. Uh, and that is the case. Now, uh, I, I accept that there will be a contest over the, the safeguard mechanism. I have uh, uh, faith that uh, Mr Bowen uh, will ensure that what is presented to this parliament will be will have a cogent policy basis, you may not agree with it, and that is your right. Uh, but he will do so, as the Cabinet will do so, on the basis of our judgment about what is the best economic policy uh, for the nation. Uh, so I do reject—well, no, uh, it's very easy, isn't it, and it's a campaigning tool—but I do reject this proposition that somehow uh, Labor, a Labor government, which uh, has taken a very ambitious position on climate, uh, which has, let's be frank, paid a political price for many years as a consequence of holding the position on climate, uh, would simply uh, uh, do what you're suggesting. That is not the case. Thank we you, are Senator Wong. Guided. The time for this question has expired. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Uh, thanks, President. I note that the fossil fuel sector re receives over $11 billion in public subsidies every year. I also note that the Mineral Resources Council donated $103,800 in donations to the Labor Party, and they recently promised to unleash an ad campaign against Labor unless it ruled out a windfall profits tax. We haven't seen a windfall profits tax, which could fund cost of living relief measures to actually help people. Has that donation brought your compliance on that issue? Thank you, Senator Waters. The time's expired, Minister. The answer is no. And I mean, you are you are talking to a party that has been honest with the Australian people for over a decade, that lost government, let's be clear, about our position on climate, about our position on climate. That is in honest with people and has, uh, you know, in the previous term of government, obviously paid a political price for holding a very clear and consistent position on climate. We have. And we went to the Australian people with a clear position about what we would do and we will deliver it. And we will deliver it. We, made it, we had a clear position on taxation, we had a clear position on climate policy, we had a clear position about utilising the safeguards mechanism, and we were upfront with the Australian people about why we wanted to do it and what we would do. What we would do. So the implication that you want to make for political purposes in here, that somehow that is all that is all because that, that is all um, you know untrue, is wrong. It is wrong. Thank you, and Senator it does, Wong. It does not do you. This question has expired. Senator Waters, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Around half the donations given to political parties is dark money. It's not required to be disclosed because of inbuilt loopholes. That means cash for access meetings or donations through business forums as membership are not required to be disclosed. 
When will you shine a light on the masses of undisclosed money washing through this system and fix the system so that big money isn't buying access and outcomes? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. Ah, uh, well, I make this point. We continue to lead on political donation reform. I understand Jay Skim is also looking at this issue. I also understand, and I'm told, that uh, donations were taken by the Greens political party from a professional gambler and a pastoral company, but, and a pastoral company backed by one of South Africa's richest men. But you want to lecture us? You want to lecture Order. us about this and Order. make imputations that these that the Labor Party, which went to the Australian people with a very clear policy position, implementing that policy position, you now want to say, for political purposes, that's corrupt. Well, you know what? I actually think all of the Australians who voted for climate action, all of the Australians who voted for the ambitious position that we went to the election with, deserve a Greens political party that might actually back in, back in legislation that delivers on that ambitious, rather than taking pot shots from that corner yet again. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Stewart. Order, order. Enjoy. I have a senator on her feet waiting to ask a question. Senator Stewart. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister please update the Senate on the work the Albanese government is doing to ease the cost of living pressures for all Australians? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, President. And can I welcome Senator Stewart back yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and congratulate her on beautiful Ari, who we've had the pleasure of company uh, since your, your return. Uh, but welcome back. Um, can I? Can I just say uh, the Albanese government understands that cost of living uh, pressures are a major concern for all Australians. We understand that it's not easy for households uh, right now, and when I look at how uh, other countries are faring, I think Australia is positioned well to ride out these economic uh, uncertainty and some of the shocks that we've seen. As a member of the government's economic team, we are working hard every day to make sure that Australian challenges with inflation do not become worse. We are cleaning up after the wasted decade of the previous government, a record of inaction or worse failure, including more than 20 failed energy policies. We saw a decade of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities that left Australia with falling real wages, cost of living pressures, a trillion dollars of debt without an economic dividend to show for it. We have an economic plan that is a direct and deliberate response to the challenges facing the economy right now, including cost of living. And one of the very first acts of this government was to successfully argue for minimum wage to keep pace with inflation, an outcome which has helped around 2.7 million Australians see their incomes increase. Our first budget focused on responsible cost of living relief that didn't put extra pressure on inflation, which is an important thing to be working hand in hand with the RBA as they undertake their um, tightening cycle on interest rates. We've got cheaper childcare, expanding paid parental leave, cheaper medicine since the 1st of January. We're putting um, resources into affordable housing and getting wages moving again. These are the, the concrete steps that we Thank have put in place in just the first five. few months. Senator uh, Stewart, first supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on the practical measures that the government has been taking to support households? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister. Thank you, and I thank Senator Stewart for the supplementary. There are some things uh, in this economic environment that we are experiencing that are, are out of the government's control, such as the ongoing war in Europe and the ripple effects of the pandemic. But there are also things that are within our control, and the government is focused on those. So, as I said in the previous answer, making medicines cheaper. Uh, childcare cheaper and, of course, relief to householders facing those rising energy costs, which the Senate dealt with, which the Senate dealt with in December last year. And let's not forget, because we won't ever forget, that you voted against it. The money that, that will flow to households to help with their energy bills 
You the voted against it. It was how this Senate could have stood up and no. provided Order. that support to households and the opposition First tried to block it. We no. are focused on growing the economy the right way so that Australians what? can benefit from good skills, get good jobs and have good Thank wages. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. As Senator Stewart, second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on initiatives that have already started to have a direct impact? on households and easing cost of living pressures. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Wages are beginning to move again, thanks yeah. to the government putting bargaining back in the hands of workers again, which those opposite oppose. You oppose the energy price relief. Right. You also oppose sensible wages. changes to improve the bargaining framework so that workers could get pay Senator rises. Daniel. It is no surprise after a decade of wage stagnation, a deliberate design feature of their economic That's architecture, right. let us never forget we that, 2 per cent, suck it, 2 per cent or worse, and we're already seeing wages starting to move, nudging just above 3 per cent. But we get that households are still doing it tough. We understand that. The government's job is to look at where we can provide sensible cost of living relief without adding to inflation. That is the defining challenge as we go to put Order. this budget together. The May budget will continue a focus on cost of living, including providing that household assistance for energy bills, working with Thank the states you. and Thank territories you, Minister. Your that time you have oppose. Expired. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. I have a question to the Minister representing the Minister for the, the Environment, Minister Watt. Uh, Australia is a world leader in many things that we celebrate, but one international title we have is a source of global shame, and that is our status as a world leader in species extinction. Over the past 200 years, uh, our actions have sent one in ten of our native mammals extinct. By comparison, the US, similar uh, landmass, has lost just one so species. Much. If we don't act now, current and future uh, generations of Australian children may never have an opportunity to see a numbat or a region honey eater or a northern quoll. In October last year, the government committed to ending, no, ending extinctions. Will the government commit to backing up this commitment with enough investment to ensure that this actually happens? Thank you, Senator Poker. I believe Senator Wong is the correct uh, repping minister, so I've yes, given sorry. her the call. Uh, thank you to Senator uh, Pocock, and he is correct that we are uh, a country, a nation that has one of the worst uh, extinction records in the world. Uh, we have one of the worst mammal extinction records in the world. Uh, we have uh, obviously uh, seen uh, land uh, and water degradation, uh, which has an effect uh, not just on humans, but on uh, uh, um, our many animal and plant species. Uh, the, I know that the Minister for the Environment uh, has been very clear about the importance of working towards zero extinctions. Uh, this has been endorsed by every state and territory. Uh, as part of that, we are investing in excess of $200 million in the Saving Native, Native Species Program. We have put in place a new Threatened Species Action Plan, which sets ambitious targets uh, seeking to protect 30 per cent of our land and seas by 2030. Uh, and of course, critically, uh, we are looking at reform of the uh, environmental legal framework. Uh, you'd be, Senator Pocock would be familiar with the Sam Samuels review into the EPBC Act. Uh, uh, obviously, Senator, uh, uh, Ms Plibersek is uh, taking forward a process to reform those to protect, restore and manage uh, native habitats. Um, the uh, ACF, Australian Conservation Foundation, has, has welcomed the government's new threatened species of, uh, objective and have made the, uh, the very important point that uh, extinction is a choice and, and we need to choose uh, a better path. We need to change the trajectory for the range of th threatened species and their habitats and, and certainly the government, and particularly Ms Plibersek, is focused on doing so. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, thank you, President. Um, I welcome the government's commitment. I uh, would point out that this will require significant investment. In fact, in 2019, 13 of Australia's most eminent environmental scientists looked at the question of how much it would take to do exactly that, to halt extinctions. And the figure then was about $1.7 billion per year. Does the government accept the overwhelming scientific evidence that we need significantly more 
investment in this area. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister. Uh, I, I would make a point, if I may, about uh, funding. Uh, and one of the things that I certainly learnt as finance minister, and I'm sure Senator Gallagher is managing, uh, is that there are very few requests for spending which are not worthy. There are some. Um, we saw some under the previous government. Well, maybe a few of the sports rights might have been a bit of a problem, but anyway. Uh, but uh, you know, we we have completely legitimate requests for expenditure in environment, in climate, in energy, uh, in um, social security, in uh, a whole range of areas, including uh, First Nations policies, uh, health, Medicare, uh, PBS, uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme. All of these are matters. Uh, all of the. Well, I'm making a point about. Well, I'm surprised that the Shadow Minister of Finance wouldn't like me to actually talk about opportunity costs, given that is the heart of the job you have to do. The heart of Thank the you, job Minister, you're supposed to do. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Policy. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, thank, thank you, Minister. My, my question really is, is about funding, though. Uh, will the government match ambition with action? And with a shortfall of some $1.6 billion at the moment, does the government have a plan for which species uh, you're going to select to not go extinct and which we, we should just let go extinct? Minister. Look, uh, I, under I understood very well what you were asking, Senator Pocock, and I was making the point that there are many uh, areas of investment, uh, particularly after 10 long years, of those opposite uh, investing in so many of the wrong things and so few of the right things. Uh, and the process of considering not just this area, uh, but the, the many areas uh, uh, that uh, demand funding, um, as well as the structural deficit that the finance minister has spoken about, obviously will be something the government will consider in the course of the budget. Uh, and you know, you would well understand. I appreciate as an independent senator, you know, your job is to to do among, represent your constituents and ensure that includes pushing the government to do more. Uh, but what I would say to you is we recognise this is a very important area. We are committed to uh, uh, getting this in, into a much better shape than it was, and Ms Plibersek has done an extraordinary job in, month, in last month to do Your so. time has expired. But there was much Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. In April last year, the now Treasurer said this is a full-blown cost-of-living crisis a triple whammy of skyrocketing costs of living, falling wages and rising interest rates. Since the election, the cost of living has truly skyrocketed. Inflation is at its highest point in 30 years, real wages can't keep up, and interest rates are at their highest point in a decade. Minister, does the Treasurer acknowledge that under this Labor government there is truly a full-blown cost of living crisis? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank uh, Senator Hume for the question. And I think the government has been very clear that cost of living pressures uh, and addressing them in a responsible and reasonable way is a priority for this government. In fact, from day one, when we first dealt when, when Minister Bowen started to deal with the fact that we were going to have blackouts, um, from day one, we've been dealing with the decade of delay, dysfunction and refusal to tackle the challenges that are now impacting households right across the country. Uh, so we accept that cost of living is a number one issue for probably every household in this country. As a government, we have to look at the ways that we can ease that cost of living pressure in a way that doesn't add to inflation. And I think the major difference, there are a couple of differences. The largest quarter of inflation was in the March quarter last year, which was actually under you when you were in government. That was the largest quarter in terms of inflation growth. The other difference is that you have a government that's actually dealing with the issues rather than putting their head in the sand and pretending that everything was just fine. That is a major difference. So in energy, in health, in childcare, in energy prices, in cost of medicines, all of these areas that we're dealing with 
and that's whilst we've got a budget that's heaving with a trillion dollars of debt, Senator while Henderson. we're going through all of the terminating measures, the things that weren't funded properly. Remember all that? Yes. The zombie measures yeah, that were never going to get through the Senate that you had there bolstering your bottom line. While we're fixing all of that, we're investing in those areas where we can make a difference to households without adding to inflation. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hume, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. The Cost of Living Committee last week heard that Woolworths charity partners have already told them that they will need increased food donations in 2024 and that there has been a 12 per cent increase in the number of Australians struggling to pay their power bills. Minister, why hasn't the government delivered the $275 price cut or other cost of living relief that it promised last year to help Australians with their energy bills? Good question. Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister. Well, that question is just wrong. Um, we, are, we are doing what we said we would do in terms of implementing our cost of living measures, uh, cost of living measures that we took to the election. Cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines. We have been dealing with the energy crisis that you opposed. Oh, uh, Minister, please resume. The ball of you are. Uh, Senator Hume, point of Thank order. You. On, on the issue of relevance, I specifically asked about energy bills. Yes, and you started off with a, uh, a couple of sentences around charity um, and increases. So the minister, I think, order. Senator O'Neill, a point of order is being called. I'm responding to it, and all I can hear is you. I ask all senators to be respectful and to listen and to be quiet. Uh, so I believe the minister is being relevant, but I'll continue to listen and I will direct her to the body of the question if she doesn't go there. Minister. On energy, I mean the gall, frankly, of being asked that question when you opposed, you opposed the cost of living relief in the bill that this Senate passed in December last year, over a billion dollars to actually go to help with the cost of energy increases that occurred under your watch, that, that Minister Taylor, when he was minister, hid before the election, that's the increases people are feeling now, actually occurred under your government. We are dealing with it, and you opposed, you opposed the, the, the money going in to get to households this year to help them to lower their, their energy bills by hundreds of dollars, uh, thank you, you sat there and said Your no. Your time has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry. Sorry. I'm way ahead of myself. Senator Hume, my apologies. Second supplementary. Madam President, last week the Senate's Cost of Living Committee also heard that 800,000 Australian households are going to be coming off their fixed rate mortgages and onto variable rate mortgages throughout 2023. We heard that the cash rate rises this cycle have increased the typical Australian variable mortgage holders' repayments by around $10,000 per year. Minister, with the RBA increasing the cash rate again today, how much more will the average Australians with, vari with a variable mortgage be worse off uh, under this Labor government? Of, uh, time, thanks, uh, Senator Minister. Uh, thank you. Dealing with the inflation challenge is the defining economic challenge uh, facing the country. I have, uh, we've been very clear about that. The RBA has increased uh, the cash rate by a further 25 basis points uh, today. They are, of course, independent and make those decisions based on the e economic data that they are seeing. And we have been saying for some time that we understand that these increases, particularly for those households where they have mortgages and often large mortgages, are significantly impacting their household budgets. There is no doubt about that. Depending on what you're to specifically answer your question, it depends on uh, what your mortgage is and, and the terms with which. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. As Senator Hume. Thank you, uh, um, Madam President. If the minister doesn't know the answer to this question, I would be very happy order? if she took it on notice. Uh, Senator Sorry, the point of order was relevance. Order? She clearly okay. didn't, know, no, didn't know the answer. If she doesn't Thank know, I'm you. quite happy to have it taken on uh, notice because it was a very Hume, specific please question. Please resume your seat. The minister is being directly relevant. Minister. Well, it is, and it's a very, it's very patronising of you, Senator Hume. Um, I have the an I have the answers. I have the oh, answers. Yeah. It depends on how much you owe 
and the rates for which your mortgage is. But it is hundreds of uh, dollars, you, that we, and we your understand time has that. Expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Ma uh, Madam President. My question is the Senator representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. And before I start, I actually want to thank um, I want to thank the former senator in here, Senator Griff, for the work that he done um, on cancer over the time he was here. In Australia, brain cancer is one of the most common and deadliest cancers in children. Approximately 120 children are diagnosed each year with brain cancer, and for 45 per cent of those children, their diagnosis is fatal. My question for the government is this. What new initiatives has the government introduced to address paediatric brain cancers? Is there anything it has introduced that is new, or are you still funding the previous programs that were introduced by the previous government? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I thank Senator Lambie uh, for her advice that she would be asking a question on on childhood cancer, uh, and I acknowledge that the Senate also has a meeting with the Minister for Health next week to discuss a range of health issues. It is, um, and many of us went to the um, ovarian cancer uh, breakfast this morning across the chamber. Um, cancer is something I think that has touched probably everybody's lives in this place, um, and in terms of childhood cancer, um, a really, you know, it is. Uh, some of the statistics around childhood cancer and children who are diagnosed with brain cancer are very confronting. Um, as Senator Lambie said, an estimated 102 children aged up to 14 uh, were diagnosed with brain cancer and 36 children are estimated to die from this disease. Cancers in children are often different from those observed in adults in appearance, site of origin and response to treatment, and they are also often quite difficult to diagnose, which does require um, that specialisation in paediatric cancer responses. So to just run through a couple of things that are underway, um, there is, uh, over the last 10 years, $260 million for childhood cancer research through the National Health and Medical Research Council, the Medical Research Future Fund and Cancer Australia, and we have also committed $452 million to build new comprehensive cancer centres in Queensland and South Australia. We are also implementing $100 million to establish the nation's first children's camp comprehensive cancer centre in Sydney. This initiative is being led by the Children's Cancer Institute with delivery partners, and it will play an important role in Australia's health system and the network of comprehensive cancer centres going forward, combining research, cutting-edge treatment options, clinical trials, other multidisciplinary you, resources the time for, for children. This question has expired. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. How does federal funding for paediatric paediatric brain cancers compare with that under the previous government? And are you content to continue funding arrangements that were, that were introduced by the previous government? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Uh, thank you. I think uh, I would probably take the detail of that on notice. I need to say that um, that um, $100 million to establish the nation's first comprehensive ca children's cancer centre in Sydney is new, I understand, but I will, uh, will check the record on that. Uh, in terms of health and how we fund, many of those services obviously are funded through the hospital agreement. Um, that is coming up for renegotiation with the states and territories. There is no doubt there's a lot of need, uh, not just in childhood cancer, but for hospital services in general. Um, and we will engage um, with the states and territories on that. We understand you know, the health system is critically important. Funding the hospitals, getting that right is critically important, as is trying to fix um, primary care, Medicare and aged care, because it is all interconnected. Uh, but probably the detail I will come back to the senator with if there's anything I have to update. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, statistically, brain cancer kills more children than any other disease. I'm just wondering, um, should this not be a higher priority than any other childhood health initiative this government is funding at this point in time? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Um, you know, of course, um, making sure that we're doing all the research we can and provide all the treatment options possible for children suffering from cancer, including brain cancer, um, you know, is 
I think it's something that every parent in this country would expect. Uh, it is funded through the hospital agreement primarily. I think the research is critically important because, again, the nature of childhood cancer means you do need um, sub-specialisation in it, and so that research which feeds uh, treatment options is part of that. Working internationally with other um, countries on their research and clinical trials and, and also those comprehensive cancer centres. We established one here in Canberra, not for paediatrics but for people with cancer, and it does make a world of difference when you pull in all those services into one centre rather than making people go around and deal with different treatments. So I think there is a lot underway. Um, if there's anything more I can update uh, the chamber, I will, will do so on notice. Thank you, Minister. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Uh, could the Minister please provide an update to the Senate on the actions Australia has taken to increase pressure on the Iranian regime? Minister. Thank you, uh, to President. And can I thank Senator Ciccone uh, not only for the question, uh, but for his consistent championing of human rights issues at home and abroad, and for his um, uh, his leadership as chair of the uh, Senate Committee for Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to work with him. And I know I speak for all senators, regardless of our political differences, to when, when I say we stand in solidarity with the people of Iran, uh, who have demonstrated immense bravery in the face of a brutal regime. Uh, the arrest and death of Masa Amini, whose Kurdish name was Gina, has sparked months of protests and demonstrations across Iran, and I've spoken on a number of occasions previously in this chamber about this. These brave protests have been met by brutal repression. Hundreds are now dead at the hands of the Iranian regime and thousands more jailed. From the beginning of this new crackdown, Australia has worked strategically to build pressure internationally on Iran. This government has taken stronger action against Iran on human rights than any previous Australian government. We were at the forefront of, effort, of, efforts, forefront of efforts to remove Iran from the Commission for the Status of Women. We co-sponsored and advocated for the successful Human Rights Council resolution establishing the independent investigation into human rights violations in Iran. Last year, we imposed Magnitsky-style human rights sanctions on six individuals and two entities, including Iran's morality police, over their involvement in the Iranian regime's abhorrent, flagrant and continued human rights violation. Uh, and just last week, I announced additional Magnitsky-style sanctions against 16 Iranian ind individuals and one Iranian entity. And in addition, we have joined partners to impose targeted sanctions on multiple Iranian individuals and entities involved in supplying and producing drones to Russia that have been used in the illegal Thank and immoral you, invasion of Ukraine. This question has expired. Senator Ciccone, first supplementary. Thank you very much, President. Uh, can the minister please explain what actions the government has taken to put pressure on the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, commonly known as the IRGC? And I thank you for your earlier answer to my question. Minister. Uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is a malignant actor, and it's long been a threat to international security and to its own people. Uh, the Gillard government understood this and put in place broad-based sanctions on the IRGC uh, at last decade. The Albanese government has also recognised the threat they represent. That is why we are using the tools available to take action, including sanctioning of 12 IRGC-linked officials and seven IRGC-linked entities. I, have, I do understand those who are calling for the IRGC to be listed under the Criminal Code, and I understand they want the IRGC to face consequences for its actions. I would make this point that the purpose of listings under the Code is to make it easier to prosecute individuals in Australia for supporting terrorist organisations. Listing under the Criminal Code apply to non-state actors and not state actors, <coughs> and the IRGC is regrettably a fully formed part of the Iranian state. Uh, I would note Thank that you, none Minister. of our— Thank you, Minister. The time for answering this question has expired. Minister, uh, Senator Ciccone, second supplementary. Thank you, uh, President. And again, I thank the Minister for that response to my earlier question. Um, uh, Minister, how is the Australian government acting to prevent foreign interference here right at home? Minister. Thank you. I appreciate Senator Ciccone asking me this question because it gives me the opportunity to yet again speak to the Iranian-Australian community. The government is deeply concerned by reports of families and protesters being harassed and intimidated. 
It, we have put our views about foreign interference directly to the Iranian regime in no uncertain terms. The Department of Home Affairs Counter Foreign Interference Coordination Centre is working with the community to conduct targeted engagement uh, of foreign interference. I say this, Australians, Australia's foreign interference laws are unequivocal. Allegations of foreign interference are investigated and, if substantiated, will be prosecuted. I say to the Iranian community here in Australia, you have a right to protest. You have a right to fully participate in our democracy. We stand with you and we will defend our democracy and people's right to protest and express their views within Australia, just as we stand up for the rights of those who do so around the world. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Thank President. You. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Senator Watt. Workforce shortages are currently putting serious pressure on Australia's healthcare system, particularly in rural, regional and remote Australia. Considering this critical issue, why did your government not put 887 regional visas on the priority list, instead putting international workers who want to live and work in regional Australia to the bottom of the visa pile? Minister. Thank you, Senator Rustin, and thank you, Senator McKenzie, for recognising that I am such a friend of the regions. Uh, I'm glad you recognise this. Oh, uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Um, Senator Watt has misrepresented me uh, to Senator the Senate. Senator McKenzie, what is your point? There's no point of order. Thank you. Senator Minister, order on my right. Order. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. And Sometimes Senator McKenzie uh, says Senator things Watt, before she Watt, thinks them through, and that Senator was. Senator Watt, uh, please resume your seat. Senator Watt, Senator Rustin's asked a serious question to which she's entitled to respond. So please direct your answers to her question. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, and Senator R Rustin does ask a serious question because we know, and anyone in this chamber who spends any time in regional Australia, whether it be me, whether it be Senator Rustin, whether it be Senator McKenzie or many others, knows that for many years uh, there has been a serious problem uh, for regional Australians accessing health care. Uh, I've experienced it myself. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Thank you, Madam. Um, thank you, President. It's on a matter of relevance. I was actually asking the minister about 887 visas and why your government has not prioritised 887 visas, which directly impact rural and regional thank Australia. You, I'd ask you to draw his attention uh, to my question. Thank you, Senator question. Rustin. And you also talked about the crisis of health in regional and rural areas. And I believe the minister is being relevant. And if he's not, I will direct him to the question. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And as I was saying, there has been a serious shortage of uh, health care in rural and regional Australia for at least 10 years. Uh, and one of the reasons for that has been severe workforce shortages, workforce shortages that this government is working on and acting on. Now, in the short time that we've been in office, the Albanese government has increased regional visas from 11,200 to 34,000 this financial year. Uh, those who attended the Jobs and Skills Summit, which of course doesn't include any member of the Liberal Party, uh, but did include the leader of the National Party, Little, Mr Littleproud, would have seen uh, that this government committed to increase the regional migration intake uh, to 34,000 uh, just for this financial year. And it is our full intention to deliver these visas, which will go some way to assisting with the regional workforce shortages that Senator Rustin asks about, but indeed the, the regional workforce shortages that we see across every industry in regional Australia, yet another legacy of the poor planning and mismanagement of the former government. Uh, if there's one example in this space that really exemplifies those failures. Let's not forget that the former government left a visa backlog of one million visas. One million people waiting for visas to be processed. We've got it down to 600,000 and we're going to go further. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Rustin, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, in my electorate, a local GP living and working in the community is currently waiting for his 887 regional visa to be processed, but like other applicants of this visa, he's been knocked down to the bottom of the pile by your government. The constituent is providing essential primary care and his wife is a nurse and is equally providing critical care in our community. Why has your government neglected my regional community and others across Australia in their need to have doctors and nurses in their local area? Order, order, 
Order. I have the minister on his feet. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Well, Senator Rustin, the answer to your question is very simple, and it's a seven-digit number. One million. One million visas. That was the backlog that we inherited from your government in visa applications. One million people who had applied for visas to work in healthcare and a range of other industries. Oh, sorry, Senator Rustin. Order. Thank you, President. Um, the minister is obviously choosing is not to order. answer my question. Order. Order. Order on my right and left. Uh, Senator Rustin, I believe it's a point of order. It's a point of order on relevance. This is a very serious issue for regional communities. I'm talking about 887 visas and why your government has chosen not to prioritise them. Thank you, um, Minister Rustin. I believe the minister has been answering your question. I'll continue to listen closely. Minister. Uh, thank you, Minister. And, and I do know Senator uh, Rustin's electorate. In fact, I had the pleasure of joining you uh, to meet with people who'd experienced the floods in the Renmark region just before Christmas. Uh, and I'm not surprised that Renmark uh, and that wider region uh, is, um, is suffering Minister from extreme Watt, workforce shortages in the health Minister area. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Thank you, President. Um, your gratuitous response is not um, very what, becoming. What, uh, but on relevance, it, I Senator asked you Rustin, specifically about 887 Senator visas. Rustin, Do you know Senator what an Rustin, 887 please visa resume is? Your seat. When I give you the call, don't be disrespectful. If you're calling a point of order, stand and make that clear, not just launch into uh, an attack on a minister because you don't like the answer to his question. Minister, please continue. I'm, I'm very familiar with the, with the issue, and it was obviously in the various newspapers today. And the point I'm making is that, unlike the former government, this government is actually dealing with the situation of extreme visa uh, processing backlogs that we inherited. As I say, in the short time we've been in office, we have got the backlog of visa applications down to 600,000 from the one million that we inherited. And how did we do that? By actually putting more staff in the system to process those visas. Staff to support the visa system decreased by 20 per cent from 2015-16 uh, until Minister, we came to government. And that's the answer to the question. Minister, uh, Senator Rustin, second supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, will you please um, advise this chamber whether your government will commit to adding 887 visas to the priority list for processing, as you currently have done for the same workforce in city areas? Thank you, Senator. Minister. Um, thank you, President. Well, I'm, I'm absolutely happy to commit to the, uh, the statement uh, that our government will always run our migration program in the national interest. And of course, it's in the national interest um, to ensure Senator that White, regional rural people Senator can get health care. Please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Senator, uh, uh, thank you, uh, President. On a point of order in relevance, I was very tight in my question. I just asked the minister whether he would commit mm -hmm. to the adding of the 887 yep. visas to the priority list in the same thank way you. as they have in the city. Thank you, Senator that Rustin. I'll direct the minister to the question. Minister. Thank you, President. And again, this government will always run our migration program in the national interest, and part of that, obviously, is about ensuring that rural and regional Australians have access to the health care they deserve and the health care that they did not get for the 10 years of the Liberal National Party government. It's the Albanese government that is in the process of rebuilding our Order. health system, whether it be in the cities or our regions. I, I have been out there in Order. regional Australia door knocking people who couldn't get uh, GP appointments uh, Minister, for three or four weeks. Your seat. Minister Wong, oh, he hasn't finished. I was calling order. <laughs> Thank you. But we got there, so Minister. Sadly, for rural and regional Australians, uh, the difficulties in accessing health care is not a new problem. Order. This is something that Minister, goes back. Please resume your seat, Senator Rustin. Yeah. Um, point of order. One last. Time. No, we're st still in time. One last attempt at asking the minister whether he'll confirm uh, whether that he, whether 887 visas will be included. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator. The minister is being relevant. Um, minister. Uh, thank you, President. Again. The evidence is already in that this government is taking action to clear the backlog of visas that we were left by the former government. That will benefit rural and regional Australians for health care and it will benefit employers right across you, rural Minister, and regional your time Australia. Has expired. Senator Watt. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you.
Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of questions asked by Senator Hume and Cash. Thank you. And not answered. Well, it's almost like, you know, Voldemort, the number that cannot be named. Two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Remember that amount that was going to be, you know, coming off everyone's energy bill, those cost of living pressures that were going to be so just easy street for all Australians under the Albanese government. We did warn them. We did warn Australians it won't be easy under Albanese. Well, let me tell you, it's getting tougher and tougher every day. Tougher today with another 0.25 basis point. Remember when you told us that there was going to be a reduction in interest rates under Labor? Instead, they're going in the other direction, putting more and more stress on everyday Australians and their families. Remember, 97 times $275 was mentioned as going to be saved off energy bills. We now know, and it's being acknowledged through gritted teeth, that energy bills are going to continue to rise this year by over 50 per cent in some instances. And what are those opposite looking to do? Now they're in government, they actually don't know what to do because they are pulling switches and rolling out policies that is making a bad situation worse. A bad situation is constantly being made worse by those opposites and their inability to make a policy decision that will actually benefit Australians, will reduce cost of living pressures on family household budgets. Instead, those opposite are so fixated on policies that are actually creating more and more problems for Australian households. We know that a raft of projects in our resources sector are being shelved. The market intervention that is being done by those opposite has ensured that investment in the resource sector is going elsewhere. And now they want to talk about a safety mechanism, and we know what's going to happen there. We're going to see more and more pressures on everyday Australians and their household budget as the cost of everything goes up. Cost of everything goes up. But what they don't understand as they put these pressures onto Australian businesses, who will then have to pass those on to Australian consumers, adding to the inflationary pressure, for those of you that need an Economics 101 book, just let me know. I'll pop up to the library for you and send it over. But when you've got these inflationary pressures being added to, and then you start charging a carbon tax, because we know you're completely wedded to that, let me tell you what's going to happen to a whole lot of industries and what's already happening in a number of industries as they look at this government and know they have no clue what they're doing, that they're going to impost more and more costs onto business. So investment's going elsewhere. Companies and manufacturing in particular is starting to go offshore. So under your guise of this is better for emissions, we're going to lower emissions, all you're doing is sending them overseas to countries who have less regulation. You're killing off Australian jobs and all the while putting increased inflationary pressures on Australian families who are currently struggling under the weight of mortgages, 800,000 of which are about to move from a variable rate, move to the new variable rate, which is going to see so much pressure go onto these households. But don't worry, we'll just listen to Mr Albanese and he talk about the voice. Or we'll spend or waste an afternoon reading six thousand words from Mr Chalmers, the Treasurer, who is looking to take Australia back to a form of socialism that is just unbelievable. I mean, I thought he was in the Labor right. I didn't know you guys let them in when they were full-blown communists. But here we are reading something in the monthly, because you know, let's speak to Northcote and Newtown, I think uh, Joe Hildebrand referred to this morning, who read the monthly. A faux intellectual episode, rather than being focused on how to help Australian families, the Treasurer spent his summer penning an essay to go into the monthly, which is, quite frankly, an absolute waste of an academic exercise and has just proven that Charmonomics are going to take this country backwards. It's going to destroy manufacturing. 
The fact that you want more government intervention, we know that, but this is now getting to the point of the ridiculous. This is absolutely unbelievable. 6,000 words. 6,000 words. Pity he didn't write 6,000 words on what he was going to do to help everyday Australians. Senator Walsh. The President, uh, and uh, I thank uh, the opposition uh, senators for their questions, uh, because their questions uh, enable me uh, to talk about the approach that the Albanese government uh, is taking uh, on addressing the number one uh, challenge that Australians face today, uh, and that, of course, uh, is the inflation challenge, uh, which is our top priority. Uh, and if I get time, uh, Senator Cash's uh, question will also uh, enable me to talk a little bit um, about the Albanese government's approach to First Nations issues uh, and particularly to the question of family violence, uh, which is a, a question uh, that is of huge significance to us as a government uh, and one uh, for which we have already put considerable plans in place, uh, including, of course, uh, legislating for 10 days uh, paid domestic family violence leave, which has already started and will benefit millions of Australians. Um, but on uh, the questions raised about inflation uh, and the cost of living, uh, these are the questions that we came into government uh, to address. These are the questions that we are working to solve for the Australian people, uh, because our guiding principle as a government uh, as you all know in this place, uh, is that we want to ensure that no one uh, is left behind uh, and no one is held back. Uh, and we know that Australians are doing it tough right now uh, with the rising cost of living. Uh, and of course, um, there are a number of things that we can do and that we are doing uh, to put practical solutions in place to help Australians um, with the challenges that they're facing. Um, we need to strengthen Medicare uh, and we need to make medicines cheaper, uh, and that is exactly what we have done by cutting the maximum co-payment under the PBS uh, by up to $12.50. And I'm proud to say that that has already started this year. Uh, and for an average person who's relying on PBS medications, uh, that person could save hundreds of dollars a year um, because we have taken this cost of living uh, measure. We're deliver delivering uh, cheaper childcare to 1.26 million families. Uh, and of course, under the watch of the previous government, uh, childcare prices, which is such a huge impost on the family budget, uh, rose by 41%. Uh, 41 per cent. Uh, so we are committed to delivering cheaper childcare, uh, and uh, that will start uh, in July. Uh, and we're very proud to be able to bring down that cost for Australian families, mm -hmm. while also providing quality early childhood education. Um, we're building more affordable housing, uh, and we'll have legislation come to this place, which we hope. Uh, the opposition will uh, agree with, uh, given uh, the concerns that they've raised about the cost of living crisis that Australians face today. Uh, we will build more affordable housing. We will increase supply, uh, and we will do that in a way that brings uh, people together to make sure that we have solutions for Australian people. Yeah. Uh, now, the opposition raised questions about energy prices. Uh, and it is uh, quite an extraordinary thing for them to come into this place uh, and talk to us about the challenges of bringing down power bills. Uh, that is a challenge that we uh, take absolutely uh, seriously, uh, but it, of course, uh, is a challenge that is borne by Australian households um, because of a decade of absolute denial and delay uh, when it comes to the energy transition from those opposite. Uh, the legacy of those opposite uh, is an energy disaster um, that has really left the country ill-prepared uh, for the challenges that we face today. Does anybody remember uh, how many different energy policies the opposition had when they were in government? Was it 22? Was it 22? Oh, Senator O'Neill, I think it was. I think it was 22, uh, and they couldn't land. The they couldn't the land one of them. Uh, all they did was let uh, capacity exit the energy system. 
They didn't uh, invest in renewable energy because they don't believe in it. They didn't invest in new transmission uh, because they didn't want renewables in the grid. They failed to set a net zero target. They knew energy prices would go up in July and they lied to the Australian people about that by no. omission, by omission. Uh, so we won't be taking advice Thank from you, you about Walsh. energy prices. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, I too rise to take note on, on these two very important issues, cost of living uh, and the impact of the repeal of the cashless debit card on my home state of WA. And sadly, what we see in this government, and we have just seen it again, is that this is a government that at every opportunity puts symbolism over substance. Symbolism over substance. We saw it late last year when Parliament was recalled in an emergency session to pass emergency legislation uh, in terms of uh, gas prices and flow-on impacts to state regimes regarding coal. And we've seen a complete failure of that policy because the government only cares about symbolism. And that's also what we saw with the cashless debit card. We saw a, a hasty and unseemly hasty repeal of the cashless debit card with nothing to put in its place. And what has been the impact on the communities in my home state of WA? We saw, as was uh, uh, shown by the question from Senator Cash to Minister Farrell, the huge negative impact of this decision from the government to scrap the cashless debit card uh, on a community like Laverton. Now, Laverton uh, is a community that's probably not forefront of most people's minds. It's a long way off the beaten track, as it were. Uh, now, I know uh, Patrick Hill well, and he has spoken. I know how much he loves his community. I know how much he has put into his community the advocacy on behalf of the Outback Way, the advocacy on behalf of enabling his community to get ahead, to thrive, to get um, people who are at risk of social harm back as part of that community. And now we are see all that hard work, all that hard work that has gone in to the last few years thrown away with nothing to replace it. So the local, uh, the local Desert Inn Hotel has been forced to close the doors on its liquor store on Thursday because of the public unrest and introduced a one item per customer rule on Friday. Now this is subsequent to the repeal of the cashless debit card, which was making a very real difference in that local community. And Patrick Hill, the president of the Shire, said, they're drinking bottles of spirits. That brings violence, he said. The kids are not getting fed. The women get bashed up. It's just going back to the way it was. The way it was. The way it was. The cashless debit card made a real impact on that community. It wasn't a silver bullet. I've got up and said this in government, and, and I say it again in opposition, and, and nobody on this side pretended it was a silver bullet. But it enabled some people to take greater control of their lives. It enabled some people to break the cycle of dependency and violence that had been present in those communities. And this government, when it came into power, scrapped it with nothing to put in its place. And we've seen the problems in Alice Springs as well. We're also seeing problems in places like Carnarvon in my home state of WA, where the people of Carnarvon were desperate, desperate to, after the Prime Minister went to visit Alice Springs and then came to Western Australia, desperate to have him come to Carnarvon to see the problems they face in their local community. Uh, of course, their pleas were ignored, but we have a situation where local communities just aren't being listened to. They're not being listened to because this government is just obsessed by the symbolism of the changes they make and not the practical outcomes on the ground, not the substance of what the changes they make mean to people's lives. 
And so we see in a small community like Laverton, a community off the beaten track, a community that's not in the forefront of most people's minds, occasionally around a, a boardroom table when you're talking about a new mineral deposit that's been discovered out that way, uh, sadly in the paper when we see some of the social dysfunction that is currently uh, running rife in that community. Uh, so it's a very you, sad Brockman. day for that community. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I really enjoy uh, hearing a sense of urgency from the other, other side. They never acted with in the 10 years that they were actually in government and could do something about some of the challenges that are experienced by First Nations communities, especially in remote and regional areas in our country. I'm really interested to know where Senator Brockman was, where Senator Cash was in 2017, when there was $245 million cut from Indigenous housing. $245 million cut from Indigenous housing, despite chronic overcrowding, despite chronic overcrowding in your home state that you're, sit, you're standing over there right now claiming to care so much about. And don't even get me started about the almost $1 billion of cuts that happened under the former government's watch when they first came to power. Almost $1 billion. And they have got the cheek to sit over the other side of the chamber now and try to lecture us about what we are doing in First Nations communities. Can you imagine what that $1 billion worth of investment could have done in First Nations communities if it was actually sustained till today? Can you imagine what that $1 billion might have done? Instead, you chose to cut it. You chose to cut it. So it's a bit rich for you to sit over there and lecture us about the work that's happening in First Nations communities. And particularly rich hearing it as someone who's worked on the front line with lots of Aboriginal children and families, in out-of-home care, in child protection, doing the clinical work in the room with families. I've seen the impact of the challenges that you talk about looking in the eyes of families. So I absolutely understand how critically important it is that we get these things right. But one of the things that we know wasn't right, and it's interesting you talk about the cashless debit card, because it's, I find it interesting that you can talk about the difficulties experienced since the um, abolishing of the CDC, but actually nobody can find any evidence that it was working in the first place. It's, it's actually really incredible. But this, is, this was in briefs to your minister, who, who, who apparently said, it's interesting. Like, what did she say? How disappointing it was that there was no evidence that it worked. She wrote that on her briefs. She wrote that on her briefs. But you wasted more than $170 million in that anyway, even though it didn't work. Billion dollars of cuts, or more than a billion dollars of cuts, spending money on things that don't actually work. But sure, um, let's blame us for everything when we've been in power for eight months. What we do know represents the very best opportunity for change is supporting a voice to parliament. Because the very communities that you claim to care about will have a direct voice into this place. What a difference that might make to the communities that you sit over there and claim to care about. We know, and certainly I've seen from the work that I've done, what can happen to the lives of Aboriginal children and families and people when they are given a seat at the table, to be part of the decisions and the conversations that affect their lives. I've spoken with, I've worked in Aboriginal organisations in Victoria. I've spoken with many workers on the ground and, and CEOs of Aboriginal organisations who can, who can give me many examples of where they have been put in the driver's seat and they're getting real outcomes for their families on the ground. The Voice is an opportunity to ampli amplify that across the country, across the nation. Why would you not want to do that when you sit over there and pretend to care about First Nations communities? 
Why would you not support a voice to parliament? Because your voice for the last decade certainly hasn't worked for them. So aside from the real and practical changes that it would deliver for First Nations people on the ground, it also is a, like an incredible opportunity to unify our country. An incredible opportunity to unify our country that talks to the special place that First Nations people should and do have in our nation's history. Thank you. Senator Antic. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, um, Mr uh, Deputy President. I, um, I, I sat listening to the contributions before, I, all the way through uh, question time, actually, and I, I, I'm reminded by the, uh, the suggestion that it's very simple to just simply say everything that's happening now is as a result of what happened five years ago, one year ago, ten years ago. But unfortunately, the reality of the situation is, is much, much more stark for the government. And uh, uh, while I was sitting there, I, I was minded to, uh, uh, to uh, look up a definition, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, of the term buyer's remorse. Now, if you'll just indulge me for a minute. Buyer's remorse is defined as a feeling of regret or anxiety after making a purchase, also known as buyer's regret uh, or buyer's disappointment. And it stems from the feeling that the, purchaser, the purchaser's decision was the wrong one, either because it was the wrong one or because there was a better one to be made. The Australian people are right in the early stages of buyer's remorse with this government. And this is the kind of buyer's remorse that uh, you'd get if you went onto Apple Music and downloaded a, a Venga Boys album. Uh, you would hear it and you would feel it. And it's real. It's real. I'm telling you right now, thank you to Senator Waters for that chuckle I noted. Hopefully Hansard picked it up. But the reality here is this is a cost of living crisis and people are not interested. The Australian people are not interested in the diversionary tactics um, of this government. Things like the voice, um, things like uh, you know, the, the, the constant attempts by the Prime Minister to simply uh, turn up at a sporting event, uh, appear to be relatable by downing free beers. Uh, and, uh, and fly off again, or flying off to Kiev in order to, uh, to mingle with uh, you know, the global glitterati, the, the, the bloke in the green T-shirt that's uh, gracing our screens at every possible opportunity. It's the President, uh, President Zelensky, I think we're talking about. But these sort of opportunities, this bread and circuses approach to politics is simply not cutting it with the Australian people. They're not, they're not that silly. And just this afternoon, we've seen yet another rise uh, in, in the base po basis points of the, uh, of the RBA, I think eight in a row now, uh, and we're now seeing the highest interest rates we've seen in this country in 10 years, which is absolutely no laughing matter at all. And no amount of diversion, no amount of trying to divide Australians uh, by uh, initiatives like The Voice, uh, no amount of, as Senator Brockman quite rightly pointed out, uh, earlier on, uh, removing the cashless debit card, which has had a completely counter effect, is going to cover up from the fact that Australians aren't buying what they're selling. Um, in fact, we're actually seeing now a government that is uh, actively um, falling back on promises. There was a, a promise to, I think, cut the, uh, the $3.2 billion in, uh, in spending on consultants, and the government's already won. $1.2 billion down the tube after, after nine months. So the, the spending bill is real, and the cost of living issue is the, the real one, the one that Australians are focused on. Uh, and yet we've got a, a treasurer who, who uh, graced us with 6,000 words of uh, intolerable diatribe, which I started reading. It was like a murder mystery. It was like an Ag Ag Agatha Christie novel. Uh, and I'll give you the spoiler alert. It, who done it? It was the treasurer with the checkbook in the finance department. Uh, it's, it, this is not a position that's come as a result of a government of, of Christmas past. This is coming because of decisions that are being made by this government today. Uh, and you know, for all he wants to do, the Treasurer, Jim, you will own nothing and be happy Chalmers, uh, wants to tell us it's, it's something otherwise. Uh, it is not the case. Uh, in fact, these are you, particularly uniquely Australian uh, issues, economic challenges this year. Uh, we haven't covered off on high inflation. We're seeing the highest inflation we've seen in decades. Uh, and something in the order of 800,000 Australians uh, mortgage holders who are this year going to switch uh, from uh, fixed term to variable term interest rates. Uh, now with the news today that those interest rates are going up, we're looking at something in the order of $1,800 extra per month for many, many mortgage holders in this country. 
So let's not beat around the bush. Let's not try and blame this on things done by, uh, what should we say now, done, done by the, uh, the Fraser government in 19, you know, 1980. These are things that are happening as a result of policy levers that are being pulled by this government. And don't take my word for it. In the past week, the Australian Industry Group, the Business Council of Australia and the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industries pre-budget submissions have all echoed the opposition, the coalition opposition's calls since the October budget to restore fiscal guardrails and to rein in spending and to drive productivity reforms to support businesses invest and Thank to you. grow our Thank economy. You, Senator Antique, I put the question. Those questions say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Very much, Deputy President. Well, just once a year we get to see who is donating to political parties, and every year it's a wash with big corporates and big polluters donating big money to the big parties and usually getting big access and big influence over policy making. Uh, last week we got the donations disclosure data for 2021 to 22, and tragically, coal and gas projects, energy companies, and mineral and resources industry bodies all featured heavily with around $2 million gifted to both of the big parties by the fossil fuel companies and their cheerleaders, it's little wonder that no matter who is in government, the fossil fuel sector continues to get almost $11 billion in public subsidies every year in things like cheap fuel and accelerated depreciation, plus direct grants to open up new polluting projects. Now, these industries are not donating millions of dollars because they believe in the institution of a strong democracy. They are donating because it gets results for them. The coal and gas donors' fingerprints are tragically all over Labor's safeguard legislation. Labor is taking money from the coal and gas corporations causing the climate crisis and then proposing laws that allow new coal and gas projects to go ahead. Four big donors represent five of the highest polluting facilities covered by the safeguard mechanism, Woodside, Blue Scope, Chevron and Inpex. And collectively, they've donated $200,000 to the Labor Party just in that last financial year. You have to wonder how much access to the table that bought them. Um, when Labor was designing its weak safeguard mechanism, which allows new coal and gas. Now, Woodside and Santos donated more to the ALP than to the Liberals and Nationals combined. And of course, they now have free reign to open new projects and trash the climate. Projects which damage land and water, which turbocharge the climate crisis, and which do not respect and in fact ignore the wishes of First Nations communities. INPEX gave $157,300 to the Liberals, the Nationals and the Labor Party. Now they're a major polluter that is covered by the safeguard mechanism, and they're currently seeking support for a carbon capture and storage project that will benefit from the publicly funded Middle Arm Hub. Now, I wonder what legislative concessions and public support their donation will get for them. The Mineral Resources Council, who recently threatened to unleash an ad campaign against Labor unless it rules out a windfall profits tax, declared neither, nearly a quarter of a million dollars in donations to the big parties in 21-22, and still there is no windfall profits tax on the horizon. Santos, which is pushing to frack the Beedaloo Basin and the Narrabri gas fields, received $16 million in public money for its Moomba carbon capture and storage project. It gave $154,000 to the major parties. It's a pretty solid return on investment for Santos there. Tamboran donated $200,000 to the big political parties, the first time they've declared a donation. They also received $7.5 million of public money from the coalition for a natural gas exploration in the Beedaloo Basin. Now, the Greens attempted to disallow that grant in the Senate, but the Labor Party decided to support the grant of that money. No idea what could have influenced that decision. And these, of course, are only the donations that Australians are told about. More than a third of all donations either fall below the disclosure threshold or they rely on weak categorisation and loopholes to stay hidden from public view. That is why the Greens want real reform to get the influence of big money out of politics. My private member's bill to end dirty donations would cap political donations at $1,000 a year, no matter who you are. 
and ban donations from industries with a track record of seeking to buy policy outcomes, including the fossil fuel sector. We want to close that loophole that allows exorbitant membership fees and cash for access uh, events to the big parties to completely ignore the disclosure obligations. And we want real-time disclosure of all donations over $1,000 so that when voters go to the ballot box, they know who's pulling the strings of the people that they're voting for. The Greens have been campaigning for years to clean up democracy, and we are hopeful, we are eternal optimists, that we might now have a chance for the government of the day to come to the table and work with us to ensure that politicians, all of us, work in the public interest and not in the interests of donor polluters. Senator Waters moved a motion to take note of the question that she asked. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it.